If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Hello and welcome to this week's Politically Speaking podcast. I'm your host, Chris McDaniel, a political reporter for St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me today, Jason Rosenbaum of the St. Louis Beacon. Joe Manis of the St. Louis Beacon. Jason and Joe had some great mayoral profile stories going up on all three of the mayoral candidates. Mm. Jimmy Matthews, former alderman, uh, Louis Reed, president of the Board of Aldermen, and incumbent mayor Francis Slay. Yeah, earlier this week, uh, if if someone hasn't read them, I... Even though I wrote a couple of them. STLbeacon.org. Yeah, STLbeacon.org, and you can click on either of our names, and they'll. Uh, that's that's one way to get them. Yeah, I'm somewhat proud of my, my read profile. Yeah, <laughs> you did a good job in the read profile. You no, should be proud. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. <laughs> uh, but anyways, Joe, tell, tell me a little bit about what you found talking with uh, the mayor and Jimmy Matthews. Yes, now with the, with the mayor, uh, a lot of it was him talking about his – hopes for a fourth term, why he's running for a fourth term. Unprecedented in modern times, well, if you add well, if you say four-year terms. Four, it, it would be unprecedented, period, as far as a fourth four-year term. Right. A couple of the first mayors had more terms, but they were only one year in length. Correct. So uh, the mayor is basically saying that, look, we're on, we're on the path. Uh, we're getting the development. We're doing various things that I think uh, can help the city, and I want to continue doing that. I think also since he succeeded where no other mayor has in getting local control of the police department, I think he also wants to be involved in shaping that at the beginning. And uh, he says also because he – this is an interesting thing about this race. At the forum, and then again when I interviewed him, uh, the mayor – said, look, I have the right temperament for the job. I work really hard. I'm engaged and I'm still enthusiastic. Uh, So he was also playing up his personal attributes. And candidates don't always do that. I mean, I'm just looking at it strategically. That was rather interesting. Um, He also uh, uh, points out that he has been fairly scrupulous uh, with city money as he sees it. he has been haggling with the police and firefighters for a couple of years now over their pensions because uh, he wants to curb the cost of the pensions. And that has been has has had a political cost for him. But he says that needs to be done. But one of the things he pointed out, um, as said, I've, I used to cover City Hall back in the late 70s and early <laughs> 80s. That's a, way back ago. The carpeting is the same carpeting that's been around since there there was new carpeting put in in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. And dark burgundy, and it's still there. Hopefully, they vacuumed it. Oh yeah, right it's been clean. well, it, it was very expensive carpeting when it was put in. Yeah. Now it may have been redone uh, during either Bosley or Harmon, uh, but it's the same color. It's the same color. Now Slay says that during the twelve years he's been in the mayor's office, that he has not changed a nail. He hasn't put any new nails in the walls. That he's been very careful about not um, spending any additional money on decor and using what they've had. And he did talk about how uh, there had been a private group in 2007 that actually brought in a designer and was going to put in new drapes and recover the furnishings and do all this and that at a cost of about $250,000, but it was going to be all in private money. But shortly thereafter, the economy went south, and he said he decided even if it wasn't going to involve taxpayer money, it would look bad, Mm -hmm. and that he didn't think that was the right uh, image that a mayor should have when everybody else is suffering, you know, to say, well, okay, I got these rich people to pay for this. And he also uh, is the first mayor, he says, as far as he knows, who pays for his own parking. He doesn't use the private space in front. There is a there always mm-hmm. used to be private space in front for the mayor. It's really hard to park around City yeah, Hall. Yeah, it is. So he pays for parking, and uh, he says because of his secretary's paying, he should pay. And another little interesting anecdote, and this I've known, so I did ask him about it because I've known from before. This is shocking breaking news <laughs> right here. Well, it's <laughs> no, he is uh, very oh, big on health. I don't want to say a health nut, but let's mm-hmm. say the guy's in great shape. 
He's 57. And one of the reasons is he's very careful about what he eats and how he exercises. And he, and most days he lives on three protein shakes that he, he drinks one for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. And each one has the equivalent in protein of eight eggs. But he says not the calories, just the protein. And then he eats fruit. He has fruit and uh, like apples. Uh, in fact, when I was there, the day I was interviewing him, the secretary had a little bowl out front with like one tangerine and uh, a banana. So I figured that was setting out for him to have. So he eats fruit around the day. And he also has like he'll have like an energy bar, a protein bar or something if he's in the car. Mm. I've traveled with him 10 years ago and I noticed he ate like that. Yeah. I didn't know about the protein shakes, but he's very um, – Strict about that. Now, he says he won't drink a protein shake if he's having a regular meal, but it sounds like he doesn't have regular meals too often. Yeah. Now, this this mayo over race is weird because Reed, his opponent, has put out a couple of ads that are at least on the Internet where he's uh, running um, towards the camera and he's right. also biking towards City <laughs> Hall. Well, what he told me at the end was uh, his intro it's, 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 it's weird that he's being attacked for things because apparently all he does all day is run, bike, and <laughs> computer program or something. That's a that's that I'm that's not an exact quote, but that's some of his interests. And I think one of the challenges that Reed has, especially facing somebody with a very formidable political organization as as Mayor Slay, is he has to convince St. Louis city voters um, that you know, a the mayor is not doing a good enough job to seek reelection, and b that he would do a better job. I mean, that's always the challenge of an, a, somebody challenging yes. an incumbent. And I think the interesting thing is, you know, I think both campaigns have slung a lot of piddly stuff at each yes. other and some substantive stuff together. I think one of the things that Slay's campaign has targeted in particular is the fact that Slay and Reed agree on a lot of major issues and initiatives. In including my, gun control. Including gun control. Right. In my Profile. I pointed out that both were at a press conference asking for state incentives for for the China hub. Both are in favor of some sort of foreclosure mediation ordinance, which is being uh, traveled through court right now. Both were for local control of the St. Louis Police Department, and as as you mentioned, they're both for some types of gun control. But and and while Reed, you know. I obviously asked Reed about this because I think this is the crux of the campaign, his campaign here. How are you different than the person that you're challenging? And he said, and I'm actually reading this from my phone, both you and I can agree that Tony's, the legendary St. Louis eatery, is the best place to have steak. The question becomes, what route will we take leaving from here to get there to get to the steak? Does Francis Slay want the city to not have the crime problem and everything that we have in the city? No. So the question becomes, what route is he taking to fix it, and ha has that route been effective? I.e., he's saying that, of course, you know, Mayor Slay is not pro-crime or doesn't want – or he, he's not in favor of crime. He's questioning whether the things that he's done have, have helped it. I think that's been one of the major points of his campaign. Um, I, I don't know – but I don't know if – it's really going to be a question over the next few weeks if, if Reed, who I would say is probably the most – significant opponent Slay has had since 2001, I think right. I, you, you probably would agree with that, can make that case to, to the, the, the voters of St. Louis City. And if he can't, then he's not going to win. Well, the, the, the mayor has been promoting the fact that the crime rate in the city has dropped and that, and that it's actually dropped at a faster rate than nationally. It's about half of the national rate. Now, uh, Reed is saying that more can be done and more should be done. He, and that's something he feels pretty strongly about. Uh, I think this spat of crimes that have been going on in the Central West End, although, they, although there was that high-profile murder a few months ago, uh, more lately it's been assaults. Uh, that's not good timing for the mayor, uh, regardless of the crime rate being it, even if it's being dropped, if people see that there are certain types of crime, that does affect their perception. So I think that's one of the reasons they've started to deploy more police officers there and doing some other stuff, because that is going to be a major has issue. been that is going to be a ma major issue. Reed's been making it a major issue, but how much Reed can get that out? Yeah, when when Reed has been raising a fraction of what the mayor has, the mayor's already up with TV ads. 
Um, and I got a mailer from the mayor yesterday. I mean, here's the bottom line. I mean, Reed has does have a path to victory. He can he has to do very well in the north side wards and his home base in the central corridor, and he has to hold down the mayor's margins in my neck of the woods in South St. Louis. I mean, he's not going to win some of the the South St. Louis wars. I mean, he readily admit admitted that. But I mean, if he can't do any of those things, if he can't bridge those pieces together, then a superior organization like the mayor's is going to be very difficult to overcome. And, you know, that's going to be his challenge right there. So. Well, there's this other aspect that I mentioned a few days ago is that the re- the Republicans. Yeah. Uh, because Missouri has open primaries and anybody can vote, unless you're technically challenged by somebody at the polls who say, well, you're a Republican elected official, you can't be voting in a Republican yeah, primary. Yeah, and there are a lot of Republicans in the 12th and the 16th wards. And, and, and they often have turned out for mayoral primaries. In 2001 and in 1997, I would argue that they were probably the pivotal block. And I have to say, like, Reed is not doing a whole lot, at least publicly, to endear himself to those voters when he chides uh, Slay for taking, quote, unquote, Republican money and you speaking know, of that republican yeah. money over the weekend he yeah. got another 50,000 from Rexingfield's Missourians for excellence as, in government yeah. but as we pointed out in the overview Lewis Reed has gotten yes, $60,000 from Sinkfeld in 2009 and 2011 and if you're telling me that money didn't prevent a challenger from challenging him for re-election I would strongly dis- dispute that so I mean I actually asked him about that I think he said he was making a blanket statement about republican money and not saying, you know, a specific donor. But I mean, when you make statements like that and when you have a past slate of donations, people are going to point that out and, you know, say stuff like what I just said right now. Yeah, I think I think it becomes a little dangerous. But but in any event, just just discussing it, just discussing it or bringing it up in the race does, I think, highlight um, or at least catch the attention of Republicans in the city, even though there's no Republicans on the ballot. See, that's another thing. I think the fact that there is no Republican running for mayor and there's really no major Republicans running for anything, I suspect that that also could prompt more Republicans to turn out in the Democratic primary because there's no reason for them to take a Republican ballot. And, And I would assume that the Republicans care about who leads their city government because it touches their lives just as much as anybody. So I do think if they are engaged, they're going to turn out. And, you know, I I did say that that may not endear to them. But on the other hand, there could be a lot of Republicans who are firefighters who are not very happy with Slay. Correct. So they could actually possibly help Reed in some of those southern wards that I kind of mentioned. So I don't want to say him making a quip is going to completely make it so that no Republicans are going to do it. But, I mean, it probably doesn't help. And that could affect, like, even the police because the Police Officers Association on a state level often has endorsed Republicans. Yeah. So, anyway, that, that, this is an interesting sideline. And Jimmy Matthews is the third. Do yes. you want to mention him? He is not collecting money from anybody. He said nope, whatever he won't money, take it. Well, what, what any money that's being spent is being spent by him. Um, he isn't going to be doing any uh Ads, TV ads. He's got a truck, though, with uh, with him on the side, I think. Yes. But, and, uh, yeah, I talked to him on Sunday, and he, uh, uh, you know, his his basic uh, theme is that Slay and Reed are the same. I mean, yeah, that's, his, yeah. that's the guts of his argument, and that's what he's telling people. Well, we'll keep it moving along here. We'll talk a little bit about this uh, so-called right-to-work legislation that's currently in the House. Um, Mis- Jason, Missouri House. In the Missouri House, that's correct. Um Jason, you you and I were talking about this earlier. What do you think about its chances ostensibly in the Senate? I think there's zero. I mean, I don't mean to be blunt, but the only way it's going to pass out of the Senate is if it's if they use a previous question motion, which is the squash of filibuster, because this is an issue that I see all 10 Democratic members standing right. up and filibustering until they stop. And when you have that many people filibustering a bill— there's an, on an issue like this where I don't think there's any compromise. I mean, unless they decide that they want to use that rarely used procedure, I don't think there's any chance of it passing the Senate. And even if they did, if it's not a ballot initiative, if it's just a standalone bill, it'll get vetoed and there won't be enough votes to override it. So I, I don't think that I, I think that there should be a lot of attention on it because nationally in Michigan, for example, it passed. Um, but I think it's it, it's important to be realistic about its chances of being 
it, it progress. Well, because in Michigan it didn't pass. It passed through the legislature. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't on the ballot. If it had right. been on the ballot, it probably wouldn't have passed. And but and the uh, one of the progressive groups, uh, Progress Missouri, has been circulating um, this audio from a strategy session that apparently involves some of the uh, representatives of various conservative groups and some legislators, and that was um, a couple days ago. And that in that one, the legislators were encouraged to push this forward and that this is something that their donors want, and which on among some Republicans that arguably is is true. This was last on the ballot in 1978. Mm-hmm. It was defeated. Uh since then, uh, generally speaking, most Republicans, I remember Kip Bond talking to me about this a few years ago, saying that he thought that it was silly to bring it up because he said all it did was just energize labor and its supporters. And it, he said it, it arguably would hurt other Republicans on the oh, ballot. Definitely. Oh, so, yeah. So he had always preached against doing it again because he thought that he was um, actually uh, he was out of office when. This was that was the window between his two governor terms when it was on the ballot, but he said he thought that there was a number of Republicans who didn't do that well that year. Last time it was on the ballot, so he's always preached against that. Yeah, and I mean there were a lot of Republicans both in the House and the Senate that got organized labor support last cycle, and even if they don't, let's say it goes through the House and they vote no on right to work, I mean if it's somehow on the ballot which, again, is not a likely outcome, I could see those people still losing because they want to take it out on the party that, that put it up there. So it's just a – I mean, I, I just get – I'm taking away from whether the policy aspect of whether it's right or wrong. Right. Just talking about it in legislative possibility and of political impact, it just seems like it's, it's a very risky venture, yeah, as Joe mentioned, Yeah, for because even though labor is a smaller percentage of the workforce in Missouri – now than it was in 1978, there is a large of there's a large block of retirees or relatives, and then I think or, who, who do live in Missouri. It's fair to that say that organized it. labor is, is fairly active and strong in St. Louis yes. and Kansas City. Yes. Would you say so? Yes, and I think I mean if you remember Jim Lemke, who now who got defeated for re-election, mm-hmm. he's a Republican state senator from South County. Lemke had been one of the, one of the reasons labor had endorsed him. Over the Scott Sifton, the Democrat who won, was nothing against Sifton, but it was because Lemke had stood with them against right to work. Yeah, and but to be, I mean, it should be noted, Sifton is also he's not like an anti labor. Correct, person. correct. Oh yes, yeah, Sifton used to show up at labor events too. He understood what the yeah. what, what the deal was, and he won, so I'm sure he's fine with it. But, but I, I think, and of course, the governor is said he'd veto it if it came through the legislature, and then the issue was, would they have enough to? override i think it would be difficult i i don't think it'll happen unless there's a i don't think they will really try to push it through like i just mentioned unless there's a republican governor that can sign it and they didn't do it during matt blunt's era for for whatever reason well because he and labor had talked and matt blunt had told them he wouldn't bring it up so you i i wrote some stories at the time yeah and it could be that let's say a republican wins i mean it could be that that Republican wins with organized labor support and makes a similar situation. It, it really depends on who the person is. But, I mean, even looking into the future, it's really – I mean, we've, this was the – as we, you mentioned, this was an issue that's been going on since the 70s. And it, it's been talked about a lot, and it's been brought up in the legislature occasionally. But as far as – actually getting it implemented, there's always substantial obstacles behind it. Well, Tim Jones, when I interviewed him a couple months ago, the House Speaker, I mean, he had said that his approach was going to be, because he does support right to work, was that he was going to take certain elements of it, like Mm -hmm. the uh, payroll, uh, paycheck, I mean, the deduction of union dues, right? uh, you know, because they want to ban that. Uh, I mean, the advocates call it paycheck protection the opponents call it paycheck deception both, but yeah both sides have these little jargon but basically yeah. what it is that it would bar employers from having a uh, payroll deduction of union dues and cutting a deal with unions and saying well deduct your union dues so which makes it more more difficult because the unions then have to go to each worker and get him to pay but Jones had indicated that was something he would try to get through the House, but as a separate bill, mm-hmm. not, not quote, right, right to, work, to work, but, but as a Which separate bill. brings a lot of 
attention to it. Um, let's move along here, spend just a short amount of time uh, talking about the 8th Congressional District. Um, on Saturday, there should be um, some important decisions, right, Joe? Yes, yes. The Republicans uh, in the 8th Congressional District, which is southeast Missouri but takes in part of Jefferson County, uh, will be meeting to determine who their nominee is going to be for a special election, uh, which will be in June, yeah. uh, to determine the replacement for Joanne Emerson, who has stepped down as the member of Congress from the 8th Congressional District. And there's a whole crowd of Republicans, uh, partly because it's seen as general Republican-leaning seat. And the four—Jason's been following some of this, too— mm-hmm. And I could be wrong on this. There's a lot of contenders, and some of them might have names. I would say that probably the four with considered to have the strongest chance are Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder, uh, Lloyd Smith, who's the former executive director of the state Republican Party and who has connections down there and used to work for Joanne Emerson, and the state reps Todd Richardson and Jason Smith. Now, a couple of the other big names are Sarah Steelman and former Congressman Wendell Bailey, Mm -hmm. but uh, most of the talk is centered around the first four. But yeah, there's going to be, they will make the decision on Saturday. It's going to be by secret ballot, and the winner has to have 50 votes of close to 90. There's close to 90 votes that are going to be cast. Mm -hmm. So they will probably have rolling ballots and knocking off the uh, people who end up at the bottom. So it could take a little while. And they are doing it by secret ballots, so it's not like the press can actually um, see who's voting how. Yeah. And then the Democrats will be choosing a couple weeks later, yeah. right? Yeah, and I would say that the there's not as many candidates, and I think I mentioned it before, that there, you know, there are actually a lot of famous Democrats who are from that area. But who are not running, and the one businessman who was looking at it dropped out. Yeah, right. so uh, the most likely person, and I don't want to say for sure, but the only person who's in elected office who I think is currently running is Linda Black of uh, St. Francis County. And state rep. State rep. And the interesting thing is, and I wrote about this on Monday, yes. mm-hmm. I think she would be more conservative than Joanne Emerson would be, especially on social issues. She's seen yeah. as a pro-gun, anti-abortion Democrat. And although Joanne Emerson was, she was in favor of embryonic stem cell research. Right, right. Uh, I really think it would if, – if Linda Black – were to win, which I think even she acknowledges is is kind of an uphill battle because of the composition of the district. Um, I think the eighth. I don't think she would be considerably. I think I think she would be actually more conservative than Emerson was because Emerson was perceived as a moderate, and you know Black, especially on social issues, is seen as a pretty. Uh, pretty staunch conservative on certain things. Well, the key is going to be whoever the Republican is and then whether or not the National Democrats get behind Black and put some money in to help her. It really right. depends. Or or if they just let, let me, say they're not going to bother let, with it. Let me tell you this. If someone like um, Bob Parker, who ran against Joanne Emerson in 2012, somehow gets the nomination, I will guarantee you there will be five independent candidacies – Maybe not five, but there will be several. <laughs> and that would be the way Black could win because all those people would split the votes. But if it's someone like Kinder or Lloyd Smith right. or Todd Richardson or Jason Smith, you you know, you could say what you want about them, both good or bad. But I don't think any of those candidates will engender like an independent candidacy. Now, if you get into someone like Sarah Steelman or Jason Crowell, that's possibly another story. But they could probably raise the money to probably win – regardless. So my point for bringing that up is it will take a, a lot of things happening to steer the path for someone like Linda Black to win. It's not impossible, but it has to be the wrong Republican candidate that spurs a lot of other candidates in this. And, you know, then there's no even guarantee that that would lead her to a victory either. So it'll be fun to watch, although I think I'll be watching it from afar because... I'll be in Chicago and also Van Buren in beautiful Carter County. Far, yes. Is, yes. It's even farther. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be sure to talk about it next week. Um, just a quick housekeeping thing. On Monday, um, St. Louis Public Radio is hosting a mayoral forum. Uh, it starts at 11 o'clock. It's done through St. Louis on the Air. If you're interested in coming and attending to be in the audience, it's uh, you should be here between 10 and 10, 10 and 10.30. Um, our address is 3651 Olive Street, um, 
And yeah. and you can obviously listen to it. Yes, you can listen to it on the radio during St. Louis on the Air. And it will also be broadcast that night um, on the Nine Network. And we'll also have it on our website. Yes, I think that's got a great public service. And this will probably be potentially the last big one before yes. the March 5th primary. So people should... Make a point of yeah. listening And or Joe watching. and I will be covering it if, yes. in case you can't. It, it's important. As it I said, I think I said this before, but I think that people who who follow St. Louis City government care because I think it touches people more than most big cities. So definitely stay informed about the candidates and the issues. It'll help you if you live in the city. I'll also be live tweeting, I'm sure. You can follow me on Twitter at, at @csmcdaniel. You can follow Jason on Twitter at J Rosenbaum, and you can follow Joe Manis at J Manis, J M A N N I E S. I'm at stlpublicradio.org, and Joe and Jason are at stlbeacon.org. We'll be back next week, and I'm sure we'll be talking about the mayoral race and the results of the eighth district. Uh, until then, so long. So long. Until next time. The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.